Welcome to Teaching the Truth with Pastor Eric C. Bogan. Clearly define what I am to do. Let every word penetrate the heart. Let what is said lead them running to your arms. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Malachi. Yeah, I know. Isn't that odd? Malachi. Yes, 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 yes. There's a, there's a Father's Day message in Malachi. Malachi. Who would have thought, you know, Malachi, come on, unstick the pages. And that's the one that the page is stuck on it, dude. It's like, Lord Jesus. Malachi chapter four. And um, we're going to begin reading at verse five. Verse five. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. In verse six, he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to their fathers. The prophet Malachi is here pointing out a time in which God would turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children back to their fathers. We might call this a time of revival, a time of revival right within the family. Can you believe it? That God is here in a sense promising a revival to take place right in your own home turning hearts. That's what revival is. It brings men to repentance. The word turn there means repent. It's turning, but not in an assembly, right in your own home. Hearts of fathers, hearts of children. And so I've entitled today's message, A Modern Day Revival for Families. God is promising a modern day revival. Somebody say, for my family. For my family. Malachi is speaking here not just about the relationship between natural fathers and their children. He's, he's also speaking about the relationship between God, the Father, and his people. He's writing to a people who had recently returned to Jerusalem after 70 years of captivity in Babylon. But though they had returned to the land of their fathers, they had not fully returned to the God of their fathers. And that happened many times. We, we'll, we'll get back to the land of our fathers, uh, the place, the environment of our, but we haven't quite gotten back to the God of our fathers. The people at this time were estranged from God. You know, believe it or not, they had, that God had delivered them out of captivity and they were now finding themselves back in their homeland, back in Jerusalem, back in the promised land, but they were yet estranged from God. And this estrangement from God, believe it or not, was impacting and influencing other relationships, particularly family relationships. And we shouldn't be surprised because a poor relationship with one's father, even one's heavenly father, will have an impact on all other relationships. I said, a poor relationship with one's father will have a negative impact on other relationships. Psychologists call it daddy issues. You get someone who, 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 who has a poor relationship with their father, be it natural or spiritual, more likely than not, they're going to have issues with other relationships. We're living in such a day. Families today are suffering from daddy issues. Because many men, unfortunately, have abandoned their responsibility in the home. In other words, they've abandoned their role as a father. 
because that's what a father is. A father isn't merely someone who makes babies. Instead, fatherhood is that state in which a man takes responsibility for the physical and spiritual well-being of his children. Again, fatherhood is that state in which a man takes responsibility. Somebody say, takes responsibility for the physical and spiritual well-being of his family, of his children. Again, many men have abandoned this responsibility. They see the responsibility of raising and rearing children as a woman's job. That's women's work. This is why I think you see so many female teachers and so many female Sunday school teachers because most men don't see this as a, a work for men. This, that's woman's work. That's a woman's job. We've seen it many times how dads, fathers, will leave it up to the, the wife, the mother, to bring the kids to church, make sure they get to school, make sure they're doing right. You better go see about your son. I think something's wrong with him. What are they doing? They're shirking responsibility, and believe it or not, they're shirking the role of a father because what a father does is a father doesn't just make the baby, he takes responsibility for the baby, the child. And even those fathers today who, who have accepted the fact that they are responsible uh, for their children, um, they believe being a good father simply means not persuading your children to go in any particular direction. Instead, a good father is one who is open-minded and allows their child to find their own way, their own path, their own faith, their own identity. That, that's what it means to be a good dad. Don't, don't you know, be prejudiced in, in a certain direction or in a, have a certain opinion, but kind of let kids find their own way. I believe a good parent, a good father, won't just leave it up to their children to find the right path. They will point out to their children which path is right. Proverbs 22, turn over there. A good father won't just leave it up to their children to find the right path. They will point out to their children what is the right path. What is the right path? I mean, we've adopted this mentality. And we got it from the world. The world has taught us, has made us to believe that virtue or being good, particularly a good parent, is someone who says, you know, just man, let kids find it on their self. You know, don't be so pushy. Don't be so biased. You know, let them figure it out. They're, they're humans too. They're adults. They got a brain. Let them figure it all out all on their own. Well, notice what the Bible says. Proverbs 22 and 6. Train up a child in the way he, watch this, should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Notice, a parent... A father is supposed to train a child in the way he should go. He should go. Meaning, you have a responsibility. Say, I have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to instruct your child in a direction that is right. In Proverbs 22 and 6 in the New Living Translation, notice what it says here. He says, direct your children unto the right that's the way they should go. 
not the path that the world thinks is right, but the path that is right. And how many know that right path is God's path, God's way? I should have got a better amen than that, especially in church, you know. It'd be different if I was saying this on the steps of the Capitol. I mean, I'm right in church. I, I thought there was a little home field advantage here. No, you know, still, I'm, I'm, I'm still, you know, begging for an amen, even in the company of believers. My God, how I many know we got work to do? As a parent, as a father, we're not encouraged, we're, we're not called to encourage our children to pursue whatever's in their heart, whatever they think is right. And this is, however, the exact mindset of many parents and many fathers. But it's because, somebody say, I'm listening. It's because we don't fully know what our job and duty is as a father and as a parent, when you understand what God's intention is for fathers, for parents, we'll rethink some of the things we do in terms of our parenting. We need to rethink our methods as parents. And I'm saying the key to doing that is to understand what God's intention is for marriage, for parents, for family. Go back to Malachi chapter 2. I'm going to show you something here in Malachi. You know, God has called me to instruct his church and to teach them. In all things. In all things. This is my job. Malachi chapter 2, verse 15. Verse 15. He says, and did not he make one, yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. All right, look at me. Okay, now so, you know, I, I read that, but to many of you, it's like, what does that mean? It means absolutely nothing. And... and Partly, that's due to the fact that the King James Version is written in an Old English style, language that we're not used to anymore. And another reason, we just kind of picked up in the middle of the passage here. But let me read this same passage in Malachi 2.15 in the New Living Translation. Watch this. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are his. And what does he want? What does he want from a husband and wife? Godly children from your union. There it is. Somebody say, ta-da. This is why God put you all together. His intentions for marriage is to have godly seed or children. That's the job. And as I said, when you realize that God's intention for me in this marriage, in this family, is so that I can help him to produce godly children, we would rethink some of our parenting methods. You know what we'll also rethink? People we marry. If the goal is to produce godly children, hmm, is this even possible with this person? We're going for the tall, dark, and handsome. But God says, make sure the person you marry, you can produce godly children. And remember that the father that the husband is to take the primary role in raising them. Again, I tell you, once we, once we realize this, we'll, we'll start rethinking some of the decisions that we make. Go, go to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And when you look at scripture, you'll realize that when it comes to raising children, when it comes to the salvation of a family, God has placed 
this responsibility squarely on the shoulders of fathers. Men, fathers, are primarily responsible for the salvation of their family. Some of you are here today. We've got some dads here, today, some men here today. And uh, maybe you didn't know this, but I'm here to tell you that the one God looks to primarily in your home to help rear and raise godly children is you. That responsibility is falling primarily, not solely, primarily on your shoulders. Exodus chapter 12, let me show you here a situation that we have in Exodus 12, verse 3. God speaking to Moses, he says, Speak ye unto, the, to, unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Let's read that again. Speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of the month, they shall take to them Every woman a lamb? Who is Moses to give this charge to? Every man a lamb. For himself? No, for his house. The house of their fathers. A lamb for a house. So we see here that God instructs Moses to tell every man in that day, tell every man to prepare a lamb for the salvation of his house. Because in just a few verses uh, after this, God begins to tell Moses that he's sending a curse upon the land, on the land. The death angel was about to go through the land of Egypt. And depending on how the men discharge their duty will determine whether or not that family would be saved from that judgment in that place. Think about that. That there are troubles that the only way for families to escape those troubles, men, fathers, have to discharge their duties. That there are some troubles your family is, go are go is going to encounter that they will only escape those troubles. Not every trouble, but there are certain troubles that your family will encounter and they will only escape those troubles if you as a man or as a father discharge your duty to save your house. We, we need to realize that, that this wasn't just an event that happened in the past. God is laying out for us something that he wants us to hold in our minds and in our hearts. That when trouble is in the land, that's the time when men need to step up and bring salvation to their house to make sure that their home and the members in their home have everything they need to escape the trouble. And every man in this day was responsible for their own house. Notice it didn't say the pastor was responsible. It didn't say Moses was responsible for all the house. He says, no, let every man take responsibility for his own house. You feel that weight? That's a weight to me. I don't know about you. You know, if I'm a man, I appreciate the tie and the socks I got this morning, but I mean, sooner or later, you got to earn them socks. <laughs> and that tie. My wife got me some, I got to tell this story. My wife got me some beats, right? <laughs> I've been, look, I've been wanting some headphones. Um, and so she overheard me say it, so she got me these headphones. It's a funny story. And so she, I get up early in the morning on Sundays, you know, because I'm preparing. And she says, look, I'm going to just give it to you right now because I'm not getting up that early. And so I was opening, I was thanking her. And so I'm trying to sync my headphones to my phone. And it turned my phone on and my family 
uh, text. We got a text. We got a little family. What do you call it? Group. There. Thank you. We got a fam group, and it face. Every, this is twelve in the morning. It's Facetime everybody. Everybody waking up like, what's the matter? Everybody's in rollers like, what's going on? <laughs> I said, I, I turn this thing on. I don't know how to turn it off. I don't know. How to turn it off. At some point, you're going to have to earn them beats. <laughs> and take responsibility over your own house. And the interesting thing here is sometimes, somebody say, I'm listening. Sometimes, at least in this case, the men wasn't just responsible over their house. Sometimes God expects you to take responsibility over someone else's house as well. Oh, it's amazing. Here, verse 4, look at verse 4. Verse 4, it says, And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls, every man according to his eating, and shall make your count for the lamb. What's happening here is part of their responsibility is to take a lamb, kill it, apply the blood over the doorpost, and then bring the lamb into the home, cook it, roast it, and the whole family was to eat the entire lamb. Not part of it, not just the ribs. Give me the ribs. No, not just the ribs. The whole lamb. Everything. From the head to the feet or to the tail. Where it's, eat all of it. You, you couldn't just eat some of it. You had to eat all of it. And he says, if your family was too small to consume an entire lamb, as a good neighbor, you were to invite them into your home and you share the lamb together. Being a man is not just taking responsibility over your house. It's being discerning enough to say, you know what? That house needs help. Because I don't just want my family saved. I want the whole nation saved. And if for whatever reason this family is unable either to provide their own lamb or consume it all, invite them in. What kind of church, nation, people we would be if men stepped up like that. That's how it used to be way back in the day. What if we did that now? We wouldn't be dealing with daddy issues. And what I want you to see here is this kind of action was necessary in order for the nation to escape judgment. Look, it, it couldn't just be like, you know what, look, it's, look, every man for himself. And I ate the lamb. He says, no, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work unless you did it together. I said it wouldn't work unless you did it together. There are some troubles that come in our nation and in our land that in order for us to escape that, we're going to need the men to step up. Yeah. See, thank God that we just come out of a time where churches were shut down. Because it reminds us of this principle. That it's not the church's responsibility, it's our responsibility. I need some men to say, it's my responsibility. If the church never opens again, I'm going to get some lamb on this table. I'm going to pull the word out. We're going to pray as a family. I'm going to plead the blood over my own house. I'm going to plead it over, over you know, my in-law's house if they don't have a man in there to help them. Come on, y'all come on over here too. We opening up the word. We're praying. We're, we're on a, a prayer line. Don't, don't wait for the, the, the churches in this house. We got, we got a family prayer line because we're helping each other because we know that to escape this trouble, this is the kind of, this kind of effort, this kind of teamwork is necessary. Malachi chapter 4, turn back over there. Turn back to Malachi chapter 4. 
Anybody getting anything out of this? Yeah, 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 yeah. Malachi chapter 4. Can't be avoided. Some things can't be avoided until we step up to the plate. Oh, God, do it. He says, I'm waiting on you. I gave you the plan. You know, they couldn't be waiting. Oh, Lord, please don't let this plague come in our house. He said, I already gave you direction. Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, verse 6. And he shall, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. The heart of the children to the fathers. Somebody say revival. Here's the next part. Lest I come and smite the earth with the, oh my God. See, I told you. Again, we see that unless there is a revival in the home, somebody's going to fall prey to the curse. He's trying to say it again. This, we saw it in the beginning of the book. Now we're at the end of the Testament. And he's saying it again before he closes the text. This is the last verse of the Old Testament. He says, remember this. If you're going to escape the curse, there needs to be revival in the home. What affects the fate of a people? What affects the fate of the people is not changes in government or in the White House. What affects the fate of a people are the changes that takes place in our house. We're trying to change our fate by turning to the White House, to Congress. And God said, if my people, which are called by my name, if you would just bring a change and a revival to your own house. Oh, we got to get to it. No, four more years. No, we don't need four more years. We need somebody new in there. We need to change this thing. We're, we're, we're going the wrong direction. God says, he says, while you're demanding a change in Congress, I'm demanding to see a change Right in your own family. While you're demanding Congress to turn things around, he's demanding fathers and children turn. Sometimes to get deliverance, you don't have to go any further than your own front door. Your own front door. It's right there. If you just change what's happening in the house, it'll change everything else. My people call by my name, humble themselves, pray, seek my faith. I'll heal the land. See, it starts in your house. If you get the house together, it's just all, you'd be surprised. Look at verse 5, Malachi 4, verse 5. Behold, I love this part. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming, the great and dreadful day of the Lord he shall turn the heart of fathers to children and the heart of children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Notice what, what he didn't say. He didn't say, I'll send you my political candidate. He says, you know what, y'all in trouble. But here's my solution. I'm going to send you my prophet. I'm going to send you my prophet. In other words, God's not sending someone to make us promises. That's what politicians do. I promise, I promise. Instead, God's sending someone to make us repent. That's what we need. See, we need, we, we're, we're always looking for somebody to, to make us a promise that they will fix something. And what we really need is somebody to hold our feet to the fire and make us repent. Because that's our real problem. The problem that we're seeing in the world is just a reflection of what's going on in the home. 
And, and we don't need people giving us false promises. We just need people shooting straight. We need, that's, how, that's why we need a prophet. Because you know what prophets do? Prophets don't tell you what street you live on. Those false prophets. Oh, lama, 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 lama. You live on cold water. I mean, you don't need nobody to tell you what street you live on. You already know what street you live on. In Jesus' name. Tell me something I don't know. Tell me how to fix this thing. We see prophets all the time. We see them on television. We'll see them in church. And very rarely do we see prophets a day telling us, everybody in the room, on your knees, repent. But that's exactly what you see when you look at Scripture. When you look at the Old Testament, when the prophets came on the scene, they say, oh, man, here they come. Oh, my God. Even the king says, I hate that prophet. He ain't never got nothing good to say to me. He never got nothing good to say. Ahab said, yeah, I hate that prophet. He ain't never got nothing. Every time I have him come up here. Because the prophets don't come to bring you good news. If God sent you a prophet, it's trouble. It's, so whenever a prophet comes, he's telling you, listen, you've made mistakes, and here's where you made them. Now repent, lest this comes. That's the, this is what I do. I, I teach elders in ordination, you know, uh, 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 biblical, uh, biblical education. I'm telling you, prophetic ministry is telling people where they've gone wrong, transgress the commandments, tell them to repent, number two, and what will happen if they don't repent? And what will happen when they do? That's the only reason to prop. That's the only reason for the prophets to come. That's their job. And he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stop sending you people that's going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to send somebody that's going to tell you what you need to hear. A prophet that won't mince words, that won't beat around the bush. These guys, look at John the Baptist, Elijah. These guys, I mean, they wore leather girdles and, and camel hair jackets and ate bugs. They didn't have no time for messing around. They caught a spade a spade. There were no niceties. Somebody say, I need a prophet. That's what we need. We need it right in our own home. We need God to raise up men who will teach us the truth. And that's what the prophets were. See, this is, what, this is why I know so many prophets today are false prophets, because they don't even know the word. You've never seen a prophet in the Old Testament who did. The prophets were the teachers. They were the teachers. You got pro prophetic ministry and no teaching. All singing. And then here it is. Oh, I feel it. No, 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 no. Where's the teaching? You need a prophet because he's a man that God raises up to teach and show the people the ways of God. And notice, somebody say, I'm listening. He's not just sending any prophet. He's sending Elijah. <laughs> you don't want to mess with Elijah's. Elijah's, he's John the Baptist. You know, God's got some, got some men of God that ain't scared of you. I said they ain't scared of you. And that's our problem. We, we need God to raise up some folk that ain't scared of these men. That'll look these men right square in the face. You might got your wife scared. You might got your kids scared. But I ain't scared of you. And if I was a wife, I'd be praying, Lord, send my husband on Elijah. Somebody that ain't afraid of him. That's going to tell the truth and lastly prophets are individuals 
who won't do the work for you. They'll tell you the truth, but they won't do it for you. They'll bring conviction to your heart, but they won't move your hand to do the job. They'll make you do it. When Elijah came to the widow woman, he didn't make the cakes. He said, you make the cake and I'll give you the blessing. When Elijah was on the Mount Carmel, he called the false prophets around. And after he put the sacrifice on the altar, he called the people. He said, give me some buckets, fill them up. He made them fill them up. Now, to get the gist of this, he's asking them to fill up four large, huge barrels of water. With water, that was a time of drought. Water was precious. He said, put them up. Take all the water you got stored up. And he says, pour it out on the sacrifice. They did it. He says, fill it up again. <laughs> pour it out on the sacrifice. He said, do it again. He said, man, you're taking all my water I got from Sam's. I ain't got nothing left. <laughs> do it again, he says, you know. He made them do it. 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 See, this is what we need. We need to realize that there is a job for God to do and there's a job for you to do. Say, me to do. See, what happens many times, and I'm going to just get in getting back on families, what happens many times where, where parents or fathers get into trouble is when they try to do the work that's designed for prophets or the work that's designed for their children. Go to Luke chapter 7, 15. Luke chapter 15. See, you can't, you can't do uh, 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 the work of the prophet. You can only do your work. He said Elijah is going to turn the hearts of the children. You know what parents do? When they, you know, the pastor told me he didn't gave me a charge. Every one of y'all come here right now. And I command all of y'all, repent right now. I'm tired of this. Look, you can't turn their hearts. You can't make them repent. You can only be ready when they do repent. I mean, no, you can only teach the teachable. You're trying to instruct fools. God says you're a fool. Stop trying to teach people who are not ready to hear. That's not your job. Say, not my job. My job is to be ready when they do turn. I'm going to prove it to you. Luke chapter 15. Yeah, so a lot of parents, they get frustrated. You know, they, I see them when, before we went into the pandemic, they, they drag their kids down to the altar. Put your head down. Close your eyes. You're smacking them, you know. Why? Because they all getting saved today. Because I declare I'm not going through another week. Close your eyes, you know. Call on the name of the Lord, you know. But no, that's not how it goes. Luke chapter 15, Luke 15, verse 17. And when he came to himself, this is the story of the prodigal son. When he came to himself, when he came to himself, notice the father didn't make him come. When he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? Jump down to verse 20. So he arose, came to his father, but when he was a great distance off, his father saw him, had compassion, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, put shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf, kill it, let us eat, be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Look at the work. Now look what the father didn't do. He didn't make the son come to himself. He didn't travel all the way down to the far country. Beep, 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 beep. I done found you now. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Junior in there, tell him I said, come out. <laughs> you know. <laughs> in Jesus' name. 
No, it doesn't quite happen that way. Remember, the scripture says God will send a messenger in the life of your child that will get to them when you can't get to them. And he says, I will turn the heart of the children back to the father. And I'm going to do a work in you. I'm going to turn the heart of the father back to your children. And then I'm going to say, now y'all do what y'all do. This is what we need to realize. We're so caught up trying to do God's work that we're not ready to do our work. We need to be preparing ourselves and praying for revival. Praying that God will send a messenger, a prophet, not a policy that will change the hearts, the minds, and the attitudes of every member in my household. And when they are changed, I'm going to be ready to do what? To do what this father did. He taught us what fathers are supposed to do when revival comes. One of the first things he did, he said he met the boy with compassion. See, that's one of the mistakes we make. When our children finally admit our, their mistakes, we say, ah, see, I told, see, I told you when you left. I told you when you left. He said, that's not your job. When God brings your children from a far country, he says, meet them with compassion with compassion when you came to the altar god didn't say see now now who's bowing to who he didn't do that the bible says the father here ran and some might say kissed that's an act of affection that's one of the problems men have they have a problem showing affection and part of your our responsibility as a father it's not just to discipline, it's to show affection. Or otherwise, you will overcorrect. You know what overcorrecting is? You ever been in a car and you overturn? What happens when you overcorrect the wheel? You end up in the ditch. Overcorrection happens when parents, typically fathers, discipline their children without any love. You're always hard on them, but you're not always loving them. You don't love as hard as you correct. There's no balance there. There's no compassion. You've got to have compassion. And we need to be praying, Lord, give me compassion. While my children are still yet afar off, put compassion. Give me bowels of mercy. Let the love of God be shed abroad in my heart so that I'm ready that when they do return, I'm ready to kiss them and show them compassion. And then this story tells us that the father took the best robe and put it on. That's restoration. You know, go in the basement and when I see you proving yourself worthy, no, give them their room back. Give them their clothes back. Give them some dignity Restore them to their honor as a son. Restore them. Give it everything that was taken from them. Give it back to them. Restore. I'm saying when God brings a revival, you know what some parents try to do? They try to give it back to them before they repent. They're just going to take your money. They're just going to take your money. That's, that's, that's not smart. I, I'm going to give you the robe. You give them the robe hoping that they'll turn. No, that's not how it works. You got to let them turn first. You got to let them completely turn. You got to make sure that the repentance is there. And when it's there, stop banging their head. Stop keeping them afar off. Stop stiff arming them. Show them compassion and give them their robe back. Restore them. And then it says he put a ring on his finger. Empower them. Empower them. Here, I'm going to put you in charge over this, you know. Here, I'm going to give you this responsibility. Empower them. 
empower them, make them feel like they're somebody, empower them, got the ring. The ring was used like a credit card. You know, you put it on there, hey, you got authority. And then he says, I love this part. He put shoes on his feet. He lifted him up off the ground. Gave him a step up. You know, you know what? In that day, slaves went around with no shoes. Only sons had shoes. When the son got to the father, he had no shoes. He was like a slave. But guess what he did? By giving him shoes, he set him free. He lifted him up. See, this is, a, this is what uh, fathers need to do. Once you see your, your children, they repent. Not only do you show them compassion, not only do you restore them and empower them, give them a boost. You know, here, here, I'm going I'm to I'm pay off this debt right here for you. Lift you up off the ground a little bit. Get you, get you started a little bit. Lift you up off the ground. Get them off the ground, son. You're making them stay, stay down there. Find me up here. Keep working. No, lift them up a little bit. Lift them up a little bit. Get them up off the ground. You know, a plane, a five better if you can just get it off the ground. Some of the hardest thing is just to get it off the ground. You know, sometimes you got to get in there and sit with the people with your child to help get them off the ground. Here, here, I'm going to help you get off the ground here. Amen, somebody. I know I'm preaching in here. I ain't getting no amens. And here's the last one. I love this one. He says, he says, go get the fatted calf. Let's have a party. Somebody say, celebrate. This is, this is what a good father, a good parent does. Knows how to celebrate accomplishments. Even if it's small. He says, my son, he did it. He was dead, but he alive. Let's throw a party. My son was lost, but he now found. Let's throw a party. When they come back and say, hey, look what I'm doing. It's like, great. That's awesome. Let's celebrate. It encourages better behavior. So many times as fathers, as parents, our children do things, but we never celebrate. We, we like some parents, you know, <laughs> I was telling my kids, you know, we, a lot of stuff we see today, you didn't see back in the day. All these parties, they throw them, you know, all, everybody's throwing parties for everything and throwing a party for everything. And uh, back in the day, <laughs> You, you couldn't even get them to throw you an a, a open house when you graduated. Somebody say modern day. Modern day. It wasn't no open houses back then. Nobody did an open house. What's an open house? Open house. They said, child, you're supposed to graduate from high school. <laughs> we ain't no, I wish I would be, son. You're supposed to graduate from high school. That's high school. Lord Jesus, I appreciate them, but how I many? Everything isn't good. They just keep carrying on. We, it's it's okay and it's good to celebrate accomplishments. Here's this father throwing a party for a son who made it out from the far country. That's a big deal. And when they do something that's worthy of celebration, don't miss the opportunity. <laughs> Lastly, back to Malachi chapter 4, and I'm ending with this. Oh, praise God. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I send you Elijah, the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The reason God sent Elijah was not just so that he might bring repentance to fathers and to children, but he brought Elijah that the people might prepare for the coming of the Lord. Go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We see this same prophecy here in Luke 1 and 17. 
it's spoken here not concerning Elijah but concerning John the Baptist and what this teaches us is that this is just a principle we see in Malachi he, he even though he uses Elijah's name it's not limited to Elijah that this prophecy can be uh, 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 carried out and fulfilled by any prophet God sends. Here in, in Luke 1 and 17, speaking of John the Baptist, he says, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Notice, to turn the heart of fathers to children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Here's the part that's new. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So if we put everything we've been talking about together with this statement, you know what we learn? One of the best ways we as a church, as a people can prepare for God's coming is to reconcile and restore the relationships in our family. So we, we, we think about preparing for the return of the Lord and doing something great. And God says, you want to really prepare for my return? Get your house in order. Apologize. Repent. Reconcile. Get things straight between you and the members of your family. Become more concerned, fathers, for the salvation of your children and not just for their earthly success. You hear that? You know, we, we, sometimes we become so excited about our children's earthly success but not interested in their spiritual salvation. I mean, our hearts need to be turned. And children need to start seeking the God and the instructions of their parents. Not just thinking that the world knows better than my parents. You know how we get ready for the Lord is to realize that, you know, there's something to what my parents were teaching me. There's something to their God. And instead of trying to break away from that, I need to be running to that. I need to be listening and asking them, okay, tell me more about this God. That's how you prepare. The more you run away from your parents and the God of your parents, the more you are becoming unprepared for the coming of the Lord. As it stands, the heart of children is still to break away from the God of their parents. And parents, particularly fathers, are still taking no responsibility for teaching and training their children in the ways of God. How many know we need a revival? And why do I say revival? Why, why did I entitle this message the, a modern revival? Because you know what a revival does? A revival lays the groundwork by which these things I just talked about can take place. See, children will never return back to their parents and the God of their parents and the instruction and the reverence and the respect for their parents, the fear of God, unless some groundwork takes place. And parents will never take responsibility, will never become concerned about the spiritual development of our children like we ought to unless groundwork, something in our heart. I mean, no, something has to change on the inside. And that something, like I said, cannot be done by a political movement. That something must be done by God, by his prophets. When a prophet comes to you, and he tell you the truth. He tell you what you need to hear, not what you just want to hear. Don't reject him. Because that could be your opportunity for revival. That, be, that might be God's way of trying to bring 
revival to your house so that you can escape the curse, the judgment, the evil, the trouble that's waiting around the corner. We need a revival. Let's pray today. Bow your heads with me. Father, I pray. I've given them the instruction that you have delivered to me. And now we place the ball in your court. Lord, lay the groundwork. Lay the foundation by which fathers can once again be have reverence in the eyes of their children. Well, there, there's a lot has been done in these families to uh, uh, deteriorate respect and reverence. But Lord, you can restore that. Lay the groundwork. Bring revival in our hearts, in the hearts of our children, in the hearts of these parents, these fathers, you can bring fathers home. You can men who have abandoned not only their responsibilities, but have abandoned their families altogether. Father, you can bring them home. And Father, I pray that, that you would bring men who are responsible for their home to look across the street, to look over the fence and see if there's a home that's in need of a leader. That's in, in need of a lamb. And Lord, give us to open our homes and our hearts and our lives for anyone who's in need of your salvation. Let us realize that the revival that you plan to do is right in our own homes. You want to raise up ministers in our homes. You, you want to make us priests us priests he says in the last days you will pour out your spirit you said sons and daughters not just missionaries not just evangelists but sons and daughters would prophesy and they'll do it with their parents old men will dream dreams and young men will see visions pour out your spirit lord in this day do the groundwork necessary for us to bring salvation to our home turn us lord cause us to repent repent of our rebellion repent of our insensitivity and uh, give us to mend the fences to say i'm sorry to reconcile i thank you lord for the children you're bringing home I thank you, Lord, for the families you're mending. Yes, you're doing it because you promised to do it. You said, I will send. You're not asking no permission. You said you would do it. We said, do it, Lord. We invite you to do it and start with our own homes. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Give me what to say. Let me hear you. Thank you for listening. If this teaching has been a blessing to you and you'd like to partner with our ministry to share the message of Jesus Christ, please visit our website at www.hmclive.org and click the donate button. If you're in our area, we invite you to join us at 4317 Lippincott Boulevard, Burton, Michigan, 48519, Harris Memorial, Church of God in Christ, teaching the truth, and showing the love.